Hi, I'm Kane Bewley, and welcome to my presentation, Role for Research. Can tabletop role-playing games develop key counselling skills? So first off, what even are tabletop role-playing games? Well, they were developed in the past from historic war games. Think of Tin Soldiers, Napoleonic War Games, that kind of thing. Uh, and kind of really found popularity with the first edition of Dungeons & Dragons by Gary Gygax and David Anderson in 1974. They're a social game, really. You all sit around a table with pen and paper um, and often use dice to dictate chance and skill and that kind of thing. And players assume roles of characters, characters they make. Um, and they roleplay their actions through speech. They might talk in first or third person, whatever they would prefer. But we pretend to be characters. For example, this is Matt. Matt is a little goblin boy. He's one of my characters. He really likes, uh, let's see, uh, mushrooms, and, uh, bugs, uh, and, uh, dirt. <coughs> so, <laughs> that aside, let's look at some key counseling skills. Although many different therapeutic approaches have a a myriad of different key counselling skills. The kind of overlap between many of the different approaches, from psychodynamic to, to PCT, are things like empathy and communication skills. Now, that is my favourite quote by Rogers, to describe empathy. And empathy is really this this, this porthole, this function that, that, that works as a porthole for us to, to see outside of our vessel, and into the world, and, and perhaps the vessels of others, and to experience their, their feelings, their emotions, their thoughts, their experiences, in a very sensitive way and often requires the person who's being empathetic to be as vulnerable as the person who is explaining these experiences. Now, another key counselling skill, which is really just the foundation of counselling skills, are communication skills. Uh, the, they are the absolute foundation of how we interact, how we communicate with clients. And they include things like active listening, open questions, attentiveness, so on and so forth. But they're really the foundational basis of how we initially develop that relationship, of how we maintain that relationship over a period of sessions, and how we kind of explore these thoughts, these feelings, and these experiences. So you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, hmm, tabletop role-playing games, counselling, they're quite different things. But there's a little bit of an overlap. Role-play is often used in practitioner training to, to develop skills. We come up with scenarios and work in triads of exploring different emotions, and, and we use different different approaches and different skills to explore those. And in a way, communication skills are used in both. Players have to listen to the storyteller. They have to listen to each other. They have to ask questions. They have to be attentive. They have to have to actively listen. And of note. Kelm says that empathy is a learnt behaviour, and it's it's key for almost everything that that counsellors and, and clients do together. But empathy is also found in Dungeons and Dragons. Empathy is is how we experience non-playable characters' thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Of how we deal with empathetic problems that may may occur, and Kelm states that empathy can be improved with interventions, educational interventions, but notes that intervention literature is kind of lacking. So before we kind of look at research specific to tabletop role-playing games, let's look at some related research to start with. Now, the Empathy Game is an absolute fantastic piece of research by Hun Nolan Kopek, who developed a card game um, where each of the cards had a small little empathetic prompt on it, typically kind of from the, f from, from the perspective of, 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 a, um, of a patient. And the group of players, which was normally a number of practitioners, um, one of them would then pick up a card, read the card, and the rest would then write down an empathetic response to that prompt. And then each empathetic response would then be graded, would then be judged by everybody else. Um, and it's noted that immediately after playing the game, empathy skills grew. Um, but it was noted that, that kind of a skilled practitioner would was needed to, uh, namely a skilled communicator, um, to, to act as a facilitator for the game. Which is 
if we look at that, that's quite similar to, to tabletop role-playing games. We have empathetic prompts in, in the form of when you're playing the game of interacting with, with non-playable characters who, who might be experiencing some issues. And um, we have the members of the party working together to try and find the best way to solve it. As well as the similarity between needing that, that skilled communicator to facilitate and, and, a, and a dungeon master or a game master or a storyteller who is there to facilitate, who's there to mediate, who's there to make sure the game functions and that everyone's having a safe and good time. Another thing to kind of look at that links in with dun tabletop role-playing games is group therapy with adults. Group play therapy with adults, sorry, because in essence, tabletop role-playing games is play with adults in a group setting. And play allows for this wonderful way to explore ourselves and to help develop self-awareness, which is key to becoming a counsellor, to be aware of ourselves, to be aware of our emotions, to be aware of our senses and how we feel. Play can also let us enter and explore this, this, this unconscious child self, which we rarely let out as an adult. And twinned with that child self is, is our ability to express in such a, a, a childlike way, in such a raw way. And the kind of group setting that play therapy allows, uh, along with the therapist, gives those limitations, those boundaries to keep this expression, to keep this exploration safe. So let's look at some research on tabletop roleplay games. In Defeating Dragons and Demons by Kauso and Quinlan, they explain that a couple of the benefits of tabletop roleplay games for, for kind of clients. And that is that it allows a different experience. We can be taken from our experience of the world, our perspective, and transplanted into another experience, another perspective, and see the world through somebody else's eyes, and see a different world through somebody else's eyes. They mention how Often in tabletop role-playing you come across a lot of problems that need solutions. And things might change rapidly. So it lets you develop adaptive skills. Skills that you can use that when a situation comes up you can adapt and change and work with the problem. As well as, uh, as noted before, the kind of the safe space that tabletop role-playing games provides. As well as the ability for tabletop role-playing games to stimulate the building of relationships with, with party members as both in character and out of character. If we look at a study by Heinrich and Worthington, they discuss the, the, how tabletop role-playing games can function in a way to replace maladaptive coping as a new scheduled beneficial activity to help cope, rather than a negative coping mechanism. They also note that there's no distinct type of people who play tabletop role-playing games. You know, we, we look at media and, and we, we get stereotypes all over the place, but many people can enjoy tabletop role-playing games. And they also mention a lot of the psychological benefits we've mentioned earlier, of, of the kind of enjoyment of the escapism, so on and so forth. So now what? We've discussed that previous studies, uh, they've been able to point out the benefits, specifically for clients. But what about practitioners? Well, hear me out. Tabletop role-playing games could provide a foundation for a unique integrative educational intervention because it can combine all of those things that we discussed. It can pull in that empathy, can pull in those kind of key communication skills, can pull in that self-awareness and that exploration of self and that understanding of self. And it can pull in some therapeutic techniques. It allows us a setting where we can test, try out, and develop our understanding of, of things like behavior testing, of narrative therapy, as we can behaviorally test as our characters. We can compare the narratives of our characters with the narratives of ourselves. So, how do we study this? Well, for a nerd like me, the question to that is really easy. We play Dungeons and Dragons, of course. It's time to roll for research. So, we got we gathered together ten participants overall, where we separated them into kind of three groups based on scheduling. Um, and that was primarily uh, an A and B play group and a control group. All groups then went through an initial survey which contained three measures. The Rosenberg self-esteem scale, the Toronto empathy questionnaire and the perceived stress scale. Following this, our first real session was character creation and my oh my was it fun. Initially there was a flowchart, which I'll include in the handout which I thought was quite fun, of a way of figuring out what type of character people wanted to play. 
We then did a brief explanation of the mechanics. We went through dice rolling, how to role play, how skills and character sheets and that kind of thing worked, as well as gave a chance for participants to be creative. They had complete creative freedom over their characters' personalities, their backgrounds, their appearances, perhaps their voice, things like that. We then had four play sessions. Each session was two hours long, and each session focused on a theme that all of the researchers came up with and, and wrote a story about, and those themes being trust, conflict resolution, empathy, and endings. All of which are both common in Dungeons & Dragons, or tabletop role-playing games, and in counselling. Um, following these four sessions, um, all of the measures were then repeated in a survey for, for both playgroup A, playgroup B, and the control group. And then finally, in the last session, there was a semi-structured focus group for playgroups A and B, which served to gather rich qualitative data. So, the quantitative data. Well, the measures pre and post intervention for both playgroup A, playgroup B, and control were insignificant. Um, and this was only over a short time period, so that may be something to consider in future researchers doing kind of a long time period. However, this study was primarily focused on qualitative data. So, to analyze the qualitative data, um, we used uh, thematic analysis, um, conducted in a way that was outlined by Braun and Clark in the uh, thematic analysis kind of framework. Um, so we initially familiarized ourselves with the data by going over the transcripts, uh, did some kind of brief coding, uh, and then developed themes in three stages, and then finally reported it in our dissertations, of course. At the end of it all, we were left with three main themes, uh, which was kind of counseling skills, which included kind of empathy, communication skills, etc. Uh, well-being as another theme, and therapeutic benefits. So, empathy. Now, playing these role-playing games allowed for players to experience a different perspective as another person. They were able to play, experience things as their character, who might be different to them, who might be similar to them. So, perhaps, tabletop role-playing games can develop empathy in two ways. Firstly, to see the world as a player's own character, to take your frame of reference and put it somewhere else, and to put it into this imaginary character. And secondly, Perhaps the empathy needed to kind of interact and navigate with various non-playable characters and empathetic problems that might come up. Let's look at communication skills. During the entire time, all of the players were having to actively use pretty much all of their communication skills with not only the storyteller, but other players. They were attentive, they actively listened, they confirmed understanding. There was considered questions to each other, and to the storyteller, to figure out the world, to figure out each other, to figure out what they were going to do next. And they were challenged. They challenged each other. When a problem came up, if two different players had different ideas of how to solve it, they challenged each other and had that open conversation and explored their thoughts. And let's look at well-being. Well-being, to my absolute joy, came up a lot. Now I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons for years, and I, I fully feel the, the kind of the mental health benefits it gives me when I play. But to see it in other people was beautiful. A lot of different things came up, including things like people just enjoyed themselves. It was also escapism for a lot of people. The ability to just get out of being a trainee counselor, and let alone that of their lives. You know, life happens, and sometimes life is difficult and the ability to, to escape that and just get to a fantasy world, especially for a scheduled event, was beneficial. Creativity came up. The enjoyment of, of making a character, of thinking about appearances, about personalities, about backgrounds, about stories. And really making that creativity real and active and something that people participated in. As well as the imagination needed to explore the world, to listen to the storyteller and build this wonderful mind map of, of the locations you were in, or the characters that you had met. And finally, let's kind of look at the therapeutic benefits here. Well, first of all, this exploration. It allowed players to explore facets of themselves, or other facets through their characters. They might be similar, they might be different, but that comparison and reflection between the two. It also allowed the exploration of principles and values. Players made characters who wanted to do these things that were different from their own principles and values, and when they wanted and tried to attempt to do them, they just couldn't do it, because it was so different from their own principles and values. Tabletop role-playing game 
concepts also, as we've seen, have many similarities to adult play therapy. It's a safe space to play, explore and express. It's the same as adult play therapy. In tabletop role-playing games, the safe space is boundaried with imagination and, and is, is watched over and looked after by a facilitator and the storyteller. But there's also opportunity to explore feelings, thoughts, and express emotions. If a, car if a person themselves is having difficulty expressing, maybe when they're not themselves, when they're playing this fantasy character, maybe it's easy to express things then. And again, bringing it back to the safe environment. You know, clients could potentially behavioral enact behavioural testing within this, this imaginary environment with no negative consequences. Not only that, but it would allow for reflection before, during and after, and comparisons in between, creating a really rich developmental experience. So, to conclude, tabletop role-playing games might be beneficial, especially if it's used as an integrative ent educational intervention for trainee practitioners like us. If, if we f make sure it focuses on skills development and, and focus those sessions on different aspects. And also, it provides those moments of scheduled self-care and escapism that trainee counsellors really need. It's a really stressful experience, it's a really a lot on our plate type of experience. But taking those scheduled breaks to just get away from everything and immerse yourself in a different world could be really beneficial. We look at the benefits to the clients as well. If this intervention was more therapeutic, for example. It allows for exploration of self in a really complex and comparative way. It's got opportunities for things like behavioural testing, narrative therapy, where we compare the narratives of individuals with the narratives of their characters and really explore those two things. As well as all of the well-being benefits mentioned, the escapism, the enjoyment, the socialising. Thank you for uh, watching this lecture. Um, if you've got any questions, please leave a comment down below, or alternatively, email me at this address, which will also be in the description. Thank you so much for watching, um, and please have a look at the handout for any additional information.